Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's learn asynchronous processing and distributed systems. Uh, personally, I have used this a lot many times because so many different use cases can be solved using asynchronous processing. It's one of the very important pattern you need to learn um, to do a lot of you know distributed systems. Um, definitely, I, I, I believe that uh, most of the you know senior software engineers would have already known this kind of pattern but this video is more for the beginners who is trying to understand the distributed systems uh, but i'll definitely tell you guys that if you learn these things you can solve a lot of problems easily um, i'm going to give some analogy where you, you have to use this kind of pattern and um, so i'll give you the real time um, you know real example as well uh, before going uh, to learn about that, you need to understand the very basic concepts of um, you know what is synchronous and asynchronous. Okay, so synchronous or blocking means when you call a function or an API, if that function or API blocks the thread which you are calling uh, until it finishes all of its execution, it's it's simply synchronous. If on the other hand, what is asynchronous or um, what is asynchronous means, say for example, if you're calling API or a function call, if it doesn't block until it finishes it and the thread can move forward and do other things, that's totally uh, called as asynchronous way of processing. To just to give an example, uh, let's take, uh, there is like one function called as, um, so test uh, underscore API. So what this function does is, it basically uh, does some a lot of processing, basically it takes up to 20 seconds or so. So just, just to give an example. So you have code before, code after, right? So you have code before here, on, on, on in here, and you have code um, actually afterwards. So you have something here. So our interested function is this one. So now when I execute this piece of code, my basically my thread will start executing in this way. So from top to bottom. So this code is executed and then it actually is try to execute test underscore API function. It basically take 20 seconds. If I have written this function in synchronous manner, what, I, what actually happens is my thread will be blocked up to 20 seconds until this, um, whatever it is doing, finishes it. Uh, and then only it will proceed uh, to the code after this call. Basically whatever code in here, it will basically proceed after 20 seconds only. This is what actually is, you know, synchronous call. This call is basically called using synchronous. The thread was totally blocked. Um, and this is what basically is the synchronous. Um, if this code is making an IO operation basically, uh, like it could be file IO or it could be network IO, in that case, the thread is actually not doing a lot. Um, this function basically is calling maybe google.com, okay? And then it is, it is calling. Okay, the, the, this the whole calling process actually will be taken care by operating system. The thread when it executes, the call is basically handed over to operating system, and operating system will basically hand it over to a lot of stack and everything, network stack. Basically, the packets will be gone to Google server, and then we basically wait until Google server, uh, you know, sends the written packets or the response. Until then, that gap is basically nothing but wait. So the thread is actually waiting until the response packets are, basically the packets are converted into response object and everything. We get back to this function by then some time has happened, say for example, 20 seconds. In that case, this thread was idle, just waiting for the response from google.com to come back. That is what is the synchronous way of doing it. What if I think, okay, maybe like why I should keep on waiting until 20 seconds or until the google.com server is, you know, return the response. If my code after, after this test API is not really dependent on the outcome of this function, I need not to wait, right? So why do I need to do that? So in this case, if I make this function as a synchronous call, <clears throat> okay? Maybe I do something to this code. I do something, some magic to this code, okay? I did something to this code. I made this function as asynchronous. Now this function is async code. Now what happens? Now the code 
executes, the, the, this part of the code executes, and it basically hits the test API. And now since this is a synchronous way of written, uh, so what happens is it basically makes a call. When it is making the call, maybe this thread won't even wait. It basically executes it and then continues executing the code afterwards. It doesn't even wait until this guy finishes. When the thread is going here, basically the test API might be calling the google.com. Um, uh, basically it calls the google.com and then it is that the operating system has taken care of that job uh, or maybe some other thread has taken care of that job or something else. That's not definitely the this thread's work. And then when the packets may arrive back, okay, the rest, this, this function basically finishes its job. This thread continues, this thread finishes its job and everyone is happy. This thread was able to continue without waiting for 20 seconds. So everything is good. Um, there is a lot of advantage uh, in, in, in doing this way. So just to give an example where we actually use this, if you have used JavaScript or you know jQuery or somewhere, I'll, I'll, I can give you one, one example of doing this asynchronous way. Um, so when you do basically a request, or a dollar dot get whatever, I just write it as request, you basically pass URL here and then on the second parameter, you basically give a callback function. So basically, um, you give a callback. So you basically uh, give the callback function. What actually this means is this function basically call this URL asynchronously. And then once it finishes its job, maybe it will throw error or maybe it will give a successful response 200 code or with some response. In that case, the output will be transferred to this callback function and executed. All happens asynchronously. That means that um, when the code hits here, the main thread hits here, it just executes it. And no matter how much time loading this URL takes, this main thread is not really worried about it. So it will continue executing the rest part of the code. Um, when this URL finishes it, uh, you know, everything loading, uh, getting the response and everything, then this callback will be executed uh, in some thread, or maybe this thread or maybe some other thread. So that's what the asynchronous way of processing. Now I'll basically give you an analogy of when exactly to use. Uh, definitely in the programming world, we are already using it. Uh, like I just give an example. Um, so in JavaScript we are using, in Python we are using, uh, you know, like G event or a lot of, um, you know, asynchronous Python itself is there. Um, so a lot of places we are already using it. Um, so internally it uses uh, event loops, call, you know, queues and etc. But let's not go there. Uh, our, con our main um, uh, goal is to learn how asynchronous processing can be used in distributed systems. So I'll give you an analogy now. Um, so using that analogy, it will be easy for you guys to remember and use asynchronous processing um, in whenever it is needed. Um, Let's take, for example, there is a hotel, uh, okay? The hotel as a, obviously, there will be a window where you can go and order. Suppose you are a person, so you went there to the window and you're supposed to uh, buy a burger and, uh, you know, uh, fries. So there's two things you need to buy, okay? Suppose if you do, Every, all of this, you know, ordering the food, ordering the burger and fries and getting back and then going home. Um, um, so a synchronous way, how it works. So let's see how synchronous way it works. Suppose this guy comes to the hotel. So this is the job he was supposed to do. He orders the burger and the fries uh, and the person over here in the window, he takes the order. And if this guy is waiting here until the the you know the chef or the waitress or waiter um, takes the order prepares it and gives back obviously burgers and fries to prepare it at least take you know a couple of minutes right so maybe think it like five minutes uh, on an average they take to prepare a burger if this guy is waiting here for five minutes until he finishes the burger and fries that is that means basically he is not doing other job maybe he was supposed to um, you know purchase some other grocery or something, okay? He's not doing that job. Basically, he's still waiting here um, to get the burger and fries, wasting his time instead of, you know, instead of doing some other work. 
this is what is called a synchronous. He waits up to five minutes. He gets back the burger and fries and then he moves ahead to buy groceries. Maybe he was supposed to buy, you know, uh, bananas um, and then apple or something. Then he goes to buy that banana and apple. So this is what's synchronous. Now, if you calculate the time it took, okay, now five minutes here to get the bananas, and, you know, burgers and fry. Maybe to shopping also he was supposed to spend about five minutes because he need to find, uh, you know, right bananas and apples and maybe oranges or something. So consider on average it takes five minutes to pack it, bill it and everything. So another five minutes. The total time it took was about 10 minutes, right? So, what if we would have done this in asynchronous, may, uh, asynchronous way and how much time it would have taken? I mean, let's see that. So, let's make this as async. And then, he was supposed to, and this guy again comes into the shop, uh, goes to the window and orders uh, burger and fries. Okay. And now, the funny thing is, he will not wait here for the next five minutes the burger and fries. He basically goes back and then, he shopped banana, apples and oranges. Maybe it took five minutes. Yeah, it's good. Once he finishes that, this job and he again comes back here, okay, to get the burger and fries. Uh, how does he know that um, he should go back here is maybe this guy sent a message um, that, yeah, your banana, uh, you know, burgers and fries is finished. As soon as he learned that, okay, burgers and fries are finished, he will come back here, collect this burger and fries and he goes back to home. Now let's calculate how much time it took. Maybe let's think, okay, maybe he took one minute to order, okay, another four minutes to prepare or maybe something like that. We said five minutes, let's take one minute, uh, one minute he took to order and then go back. So he took one minute here, he went here, he took five minutes, like as usual, like, like earlier, he took five minutes to shop banana, apple and oranges. Now totally he, he spent about you know, six minutes. So he efficiently used his time to do other work so there is no wastage of time basically if this guy was a thread okay and this uh, you know ordering the burger and function was a function and or you know purchasing banana apples and orange was a function there's one function two function basically in asynchronous way he would have executed this function this function in just six minutes but in this you know synchronous way he would have taken you know 10 minutes because he just waited four minutes waiting for burgers and fries to you know uh, prepare burgers and fries so that's kind of waste of time when we say waste of time it's a waste of processor time or waste of resources and you know that's what happened when in, in any language if you use like say for example python if you are making a network call or ivo call um, you're basically just waiting until the response comes back because CPU is doing that call, you know, calling the server and getting the response and all of that stuff. You are not really doing any job. You're just waiting uh, to interrupt to come back um, to get the response. It's totally a waste of time, right? You can, you could have actually used that time to process something else. Then you would have done some much more work using the same thread itself. So that's why a synchronous way of processing is a lot important. But if you see, I said that this guy would have, uh, the, the waiters or waiter would have sent a message to this guy when he is shopping apple and banana. That's the one thing extra needed for the synchronous processing. That means that he needs a way to communicate to this guy that something is uh, ready or something is processing. So maybe if we will use Q or some way. I'm going to explain. So let's just remember this analogy for now. I'm going to take a real time example and then I'll show you how exactly to do that. Let's take an example. So I have built a web application where you can send a video to me. I'm going to apply filter on top of it, make it look much more dramatic or look like a movie basically. You basically shoot a video on your phone and you send it to this web app. We are going to process it in a way it look like a movie. How cool is that, right? So how do we basically do it? So I have a, I have some I've written some code. Basically, you just need to, uh, you know, call, uh, you know, process video. Give the video to this function. It is going to take some time. Means maybe like five minutes, because it's it is like a lot of video processing. So this function is going to take five minutes, and then it it gives you 
it processes that video to look like a very good edited movie. So now, how do we design it? So simple way, web app. So I'm going to write a service. Basically, that what that service is. So I'm going to write a service called as uh, what is it? Uh, process video. It takes a request and it calls this one and then returns the response and response is the video itself okay I'm going to mention V as video and the request has a video so this itself is a request okay so that's all this is a there is a service it takes a request um, and then it calls the process video and it gives the video to it once it processes, uh, maybe it returns the video and I'm going to pass the same video here, return response. So it basically gives back. So how? User is going to upload using his browser to this function on my web app. Okay. And then I got the video, I process it. It took me five minutes and then I return the response back to the user. He basically, you know, downloads it and watches that movie, which is which looked like a movie. So everything works right so if there are hundred users basically making a request I will be having hundred threads processing it and returning back the good thing is everything is working but the funny thing is user has to wait you know what happens if the user closes this browser <clears throat> because I told you it this function is going to take five minutes that means that my request thread is blocked for five minutes because this function is not returning anything until its process finishes after five minutes only after five minutes it is going to give me the processed video and then only I can return the response that means that this call has to wait up to five five minutes right obviously so uploading time plus processing time plus returning time let's take uploading time is negligible we have a higher bandwidth you know be you know very fast uh, internet so let's take only processing name five minutes we took and then return it what if this user has some other work and he doesn't um, he has to go back he can't just upload and then go back receive the video later so he has to wait up to five minutes to get his video back this is kind of bad you know five minutes is still acceptable what if this processing was taken 15 minutes okay let's let's change the scenario let's make it is taking 15 minutes what happens he has to wait 15 minutes to process that video and give it back until then he was not supposed to shut down his computer or close his browser or he has to he basically the the tab or the computer should be on until this um, whole process finishes if for ex if for some reason if the internet went down this connection closes it and this this whole process will somehow time out because he doesn't know it doesn't have active connection to return back to the client so basically everything goes for a toss the whole maybe you waited until 14 minutes and in the end of the 14 minutes something happened maybe the internet or the power gone or something happened then everything is lost so we have to change the design in a way that user submits it and he can do whatever he wants he can shut down his computer go back whatever he wants to do and then even after he, if he comes back the processed video should be there in his account page or maybe sent over an email something like that so that would be much better right so let's change this uh, architecture to that way to process that way so how do we do that so let's do one thing I'm going to <clears throat> add some workers. So the workers are think it as threads. Okay. Thread one, thread two, thread three. So fine. Now I need a way, you know, I need a queue where to communicate with these guys. So what this thread does is this thread will be waiting for any message in the queue. Queue is like a simple queue data structure, right? First in, first out, okay? This is, think it as FI, FO. Any, if you put a message in here, it just um, go, it will be popped out in the same order. So what these threads will be doing is, I have written the code of that thread in a way that these threads will be waiting for message in this queue, okay? They all are looking into this queue they're basically waiting for any messages there or not. So I'm going to move this function T 
to here. Which function? Only the process video. Process underscore video. I'm going to move it here. Okay. A same function here as well. That's all. So whenever I put a message here with the video, whatever this guy has uploaded, this process function basically takes that message and then processes. That's all I have written now. Now I need, I need uh, still, still I need, uh, you know, what is that? I still need a request handler or a service or an API which basically accept the request and response and return the response. So what I wrote was process video or whatever. Okay, this take request. So it basically should call that. So what I do is add to queue and this video and return response. Now here the difference is this message, how it look like um, status processing. I will tell you why, why all of this stuff. Now, how this, you know, pattern or this uh, way of processing works. Let's repeat the scenario. Let's take, this is going to take 15 minutes. Uh, basically, this function is going to take 15 minutes. Let's, I'm just writing it here. So now this guy does the same thing. Open this browser, open the website, uh, you know, website. He basically upload this video. Um, we're going to not consider the time to upload. So negligible time, it went here. We got the video from request, okay. I, what I did is add and underscore queue. I put a video into the queue. Basically, that message was sent over here. I'm gonna rub this. So that video is in here in the message. And then, since it's a synchronous way of doing it, right, the adding queue is just uh, adding a message and returning it. That means that it finished it in in fraction of millisecond because adding it to data structure is simple right so it doesn't going to take uh, a lot of time so within a fraction of a second it, we added a message to the data structure and then we return the response called status processing and then what I get here immediately was the JSON with status processing that's it so what it means is for him we have su successfully submitted the video for the processing. That's it. Now he can close this browser or shut down his computer. He can do whatever he wants. There is no need for this connection. So we just sent it and received within a, f within a second, maybe one second or something. And all work is done. Now what happens here is what the real asynchronous way of processing. Now this guy can go do whatever they want. So they ha he has the complete freedom to do whatever he wants. Now what happens here is, we have the video in the data structure. Now, as I told you, these threads will be waiting for the message in the data structure. As soon as the message appears, one of them will get that message. Basically, this message contains the video itself. Consider the thread two got hold of this message and this message will go here, okay? He will process until what time? 15 minutes. So this thread is blocked for 15 minutes. Not the actual user is not blocked not the service is blocked, only the worker thread is blocked for 15 minutes, he is processing it. Now these two threads are still free. Now I can still upload uh, you know, more videos, some other users can upload and these two can pick it. So I have three threads, that means maximum of three people can only uh, you know, upload the videos and process it. What happens if more people upload? Maybe like I told you maximum of three people can get the result in within 15 minutes. But what happens if more people say, there are another two guys want to process, there are totally five guys, three people uploaded, three threads got busy, so consider like everyone is busy now. I sent three message, everyone picked, so basically three threads are using. Now another two guys came in, they also uploaded their video. Now what happens, another two message are here. Now these message are still in the queue and nobody is going to pick it up because there are no th free threads who can pick it up this message for processing. Now what happens these will stay there itself until one of the thread becomes free. When they become free after 15 
whatever, 15 minutes, right? After 15 minutes, one of the thread will become free. Since thread two is picked up first, maybe he might finish early. So he finishes the process, uh, processing the video, and then what he should do, either he can write it to the DB or put it into some storage, maybe he put it into some folder or somewhere, he stores that video and updates in the DB that completed the processing, okay? Or, I mean, I, we can do in one more way as well. Let's keep it simple. He updates the DB that I finished the processing. Now he's free. Once he's free, what he'll do? He will actually call, uh, checks the queue for any messages are there. Definitely there are two messages waiting. So this guy picks up one more message and he starts to process. Later, maybe three or one will finish. Anyone finishes early, then he will again update the DB that I finished processing the video and then he picks this message and process it. Now the advantage is with the limited resource itself we were able to still process asynchronously. In the earlier case what used to happen is we didn't have this model. We used to process in the synchronous way. We used to process here itself. The more people come in we have to have so many threads to accept and process those much uh, you know traffic. What if I just had you know just three cores. I mean consider one thread per core. So in that case at max, I can only process three people. If other guy comes in, he either his request will be waiting or maybe he'll get, uh, you know, 500 error or something because we couldn't process because only you have three threads and all of them are blocked. In this way, we can accept even hundreds of, uh, you know, requests. Hundreds of messages will be waiting in the queue to be processed. As and when these threads are free, they will process it slowly. Maybe they take uh, one hour or two hour because they has to finish one by one right first in first out let it be no problem at least the video will be processed after one hour and users can be get notified how instead of update once this thread finishes their job instead of updating it to the DB they can do still more work maybe I will I will have one more queue so these guys once they finishes they put a message called finished maybe I have couple more of threads here they will be doing looking into this queue the similar way how they are looking what their job is to send a SMS or an email with the video attached to the user respective user so maybe whenever they have maybe they would have captured the email ID as well sending the email ID so here also the same processing once they finishes it they put a message saying okay I finished my job please send an email he would have sent it maybe because that's not his really his job so he won't do it maybe we could have done that also so but let's let's um, do this way he will put a message here and then these threads basically these are the notification threads they basically take that message um, with the video processed video and the email id and they're going to attach it to the email and then send it so Everything is working asynchronously. We were able to scale as well. How do we scale? If tomorrow, if I want to process much more video, I can just add more threads. Add thread, you know, thread uh, four, thread five, thread six, thread seven. You can add as much, as many threads, and then it still works. Not in the same machine. Maybe this in one machine, and this in one more machine, but all of them connect, connect to the same queue data structure. This queue data structure could be RabbitMQ or you know Redis or it could be Kafka, anything which actually supports AMQP. What is AMQP? It is Asynchronous Message Queuing Protocol. Okay, so if you, if you really want to explore this way of doing it, uh, I mean I'm a Python guy so I know some of the frameworks. You can use Celery uh, framework um, which is basically uh, gives you the same kind of abstraction where you don't need to do a lot of stuff You just need to write a function and then decorate it with the uh, Celery's function methods uh, and then you can basically Have the capabilities to do all of the stuff out of the box. You don't need to do a lot of configuration or not to Connecting and all is so easy. You just need to just explore Celery or um, Maybe search for how to do a synchronous processing in whatever language you want to do maybe Java you know PHP or JavaScript whatever language check that but the underlying pattern is this whenever you want to do uh, processing in a separate uh, basically these are the executors or workers these are the request handlers only they will just this work is like just the accepting the request 
this guy's work is processing. It's like we're still following the uh, you know solid principles S you know single responsibility. This responsibility, this responsibility, and this responsibility. Here only notification responsibility. Here processing the video, and here only accepting the request. One more important thing here is maybe we need machines with higher GPU. We can have GPU based machines for these kind of processing, but here we don't need higher GPU. We don't need GPU at all. We just need uh, you know more CPU cores um, and better RAM. He, but these machines where thre these threads have might have you know better GPUs because they are doing a lot of video processing. So we could have had a GPU based machines for these things, but not for these. Okay. So that way we can do a lot of you know optimization um, like. Um, so this is this is what the asynchronous way of processing. Um, so where you can use it, I'll give you some examples. So the video is one example, right? Anything, any processing which takes more time, which takes more time than the request timeout, or if you don't want to make use of wait, then this is the model you should go for. Like report generation, maybe PDF report generation. So some request is requesting to gener some, generate some report. You, what do you have to do? You have to just submit, put it into the worker threads and let it generate. You can send a notification or you can do one more way like polling. The user will be keep on checking the database whether my job is finished or not, should finished or not. Who will update the finished? Um, once it is finished, the, this thread will update that I have finished the job. So once that updates the DB, in the polling we will get to know that it is finished. We can retrieve the, you know, whatever we wanted to process. So that's how it can be. Or if you have an active WebSocket connection, you can send a request to process via WebSocket. It will process it. And then we get one more message later in an active connection that it is processed, you can still download it. So this is how it basically works. The one thing I still want to give a note is, um, for simplicity purpose, I told that you can pass the whole video into the data structure. Hypothetically, you can, but it's not the good way to do it. Basically, you have to send, just send a reference to the video wherever it is saved, and then these guys will download from that storage and then process it. That's the only thing, um, but rest all is the way it works. Um, so this is, this is used everywhere, um, wherever, like you go to Facebook or you go to YouTube, YouTube, whenever you upload the video, it processes in the background, this is how it, do, it is done. Even in Facebook, when you request to download user data, I'll, Facebook does it in the same way. They, they process it asynchronously and they download it or they will mail you once they process it. Um, or maybe, I don't know about IMPS transaction and everything, you can actually use there also. You can use it in report generation. Um, there are so many places where you can use it. Um, I hope I was clear to make you guys understand. Uh, there is a lot to grasp, but um, watch this video once again. Maybe you'll definitely understand how this works. And also, uh, just just take a look at Celery framework, um, which is basically Python. You can implement it. Uh, there are Hello World, Hello World examples there in Celery's GitHub. Uh, you can use them to learn as well. Um, I think, yeah, thank you so much.